being the co-chair of this session, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Steiner Pilli. He's a professor at the Oslo School of Architecture and Design and holds masters and a PhD in materials and product design. Now the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, also, thank you to Professor Najib Kayous. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> My last name in, in Spanish is Sharap. Sharap, okay. <laughs> you want me to call you that? <laughs> you can call me Sharap. Okay, call you that. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I was asked to give a talk about a positive methodology for a more effective education process. And um, I'm not going to bore you with the statistics where I come from. I just had to say that I come from Norway, from Oslo, from a quite small specialist university. We just got 600 uh, students. We got up to now a ratio between students and, and teacher of uh, 8 to 1, which is quite good. But we see the same thing as happens all over the place, that these numbers are hard to hold uh, more and more schools feel the pressure and then the call is to do things smarter because we can't do things so much uh, faster but smarter we can still do uh, the presentation I'm going to give is kind of have three layers or three uh, pillars or whatever you're gonna call it the first is a little bit uh, a quick tutorial into design uh, the second is small tools and methods that's kind of uh, banal but kind of uh, leading up to something and the last part is uh, maybe uh, a little bit more provocative, but we'll see when we get there. Um, design thinking. This is kind of the, the maybe it's provocative already, but if you, if you search for design thinking on the net, uh, this is one of the pictures you get up. And design thinking has really picked up. This was something that designers and architects kind of uh, hoarded and kept for themselves, but especially in the business sector, they really seen that uh, benefits of having a design thinking approach uh, to all kinds of stuff. And if you go around different places now, you hear about this design thinking, especially in business schools and also in public business, NGOs, and so on. So I'm not going to give you the full tour about design thinking because that's, that's a big thing. But I'm going to give you a couple of things so that you can understand where it comes from. Um, I also have two small little threads going besides education methods, and that's 3D printing, that's already been mentioned, and, um, and also um, uh, this kind of uh, educational models and design. So, um, this is a picture I took in Norway, you don't understand what it says there, but what I can tell you is that they all have their history. And this is one of the most important thing about design thinking. It's all about the user. The user is in center. And it's not only you as the one that's handling it, it's all around it. So especially the health sector is really thinking this way now, not just about the patient, but the, the relatives, those who work there, those who are surrounding the whole systems. So the user is a much more bigger term than it used to be. So the user-centered thinking is one of the pillars when it comes to design thinking. And you can imagine it too, if you're designing products, do you really have an understanding of the users, not only the guy who actually take this bottle and open the drink, Someone has made it. Someone has actually put it together. Someone has put water into it. And, all the, and after when you finish it, what do you do with it? The whole life cycle, who has also users. So being aware of the user, super important. Um, the second thing is a holistic view. Everybody's, I mean, this is, holistic view is important, but I have a little example here. Um, picture you see up here is, kind of the big mantra when it comes to 3D printing and why it's so cool and why it's so smart. Because what it says that if you compare producing, a, for instance, this phone cover here, if you're going to do it in the uh, usual way, the injection molding, you will start out with just a few examples, a huge investment cost in, in tools. 3D printing have no tools, so that means that it doesn't cost anything. Just one price, it costs $5 or whatever it costs to, to print it out. We claim that, okay, that's <coughs> kind of true, but it doesn't really tell the whole picture. Because if you can just, if you're just gonna make one thing, what you haven't thought about is someone is gonna make it. Someone has to make the drawing of that bottle or this cover here. They're gonna get paid too. 
And if you're just going to produce one, and it says $5 to produce it, and the designer has spent one week designing it, the price isn't, isn't $5. It's much, much more. So when we did this uh, thing here, we made this cover. And first, we did this ordinary thing. And then we split it up. And we saw, OK, here is the actual cost of the whole thing. And then we see there is a whole different kind of story. First of all, they're quite much closer. And there is kind of a sweet spot somewhere. And at a much earlier stage, it's actually OK to still mass produce. This is debatable, of course, but it's about seeing the whole picture. Next pillar is iterate, prototype, test. Over and over, doing iterations. It's not about testing one thing, it doesn't work, test this, oh, it looks okay, I move on. No, you keep on doing it. You see, is there still possible to do it better? You don't necessarily wait to the next version. If you look at computer programs, they do that all the time. And what they do is they just launch it. And then they let people kind of do the iterations and get feedback, and then they come up with version 17.32 or something like that. If you do product design, you can't do that. So then you have to do that iteration somewhere else, on your desk or whatever. I'm going to show you more of these pictures later. But iterating, prototyping, that means testing it, and get a feedback from the test, the feedback loop again. The last, failing. Failing is great. This is a, a challenge of the school last week, I think. And the whole purpose was to fail. And you should fail glorious. That's kind of what it says there, I think, to get out of your comfort zone and fail with elegance. <laughs> Which is kind of a little bit uh, iffy thing to do. But the whole th this is kind of a, a, a proverb here. Fail fast and fail early. <laughs> Which is a good thing. You should fail fast and you should fail early. <laughs> what? As frequent as possible. And as frequent as possible, <laughs> yeah. And it should be allowed to do it. So. This is actually one of the really important things, which actually those who are using design thinking doesn't really quite understand. Because they, they say that, yeah, I iterated once or twice, but uh, we couldn't afford to do it anymore, or a dozen of reasons. But this is actually the whole thing. If you haven't really tried, so you fail, you haven't probably really done it hard enough. It's like doing something new. Hmm? Cool. <laughs> so. So actually, actually, what we're doing now, we're we don't. Here. Was it Caius who told you? Was he shut up or? Uh, no. no. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. Um, so this is like kind of the the, the, the background of the, of the talk. So um, when we're going to teach the product product design, which is kind of what the basis of this this talk is. Uh, we try to do this in several layers, or multiple layers. Um, and in this uh, particular example, we're using 3D printing to enhance motivation and build research. So we kind of do a lot of things at the same time, which is an excellent recipe to fail. But still, we try to do it. Um, for instance, this is, I'm just going to go quickly to it because it's easier thing. Computational design. How do you learn computational design? Simulations, mechanics. Okay, build something. Build something. Fabulous, because then you have mechanics, simulation, you have testing, and you have building these nuts in, in CAD systems. And I can tell you, this failed several times. It's a reason why it's indoor. We couldn't have it outside. It was meant to be outside. We didn't dare to do it. But a whole different ways of actually learning simulation and mechanics. The students are doing this. They love it. Dynamics and statistics. What you're doing here is that you see you have a ball, and you throw a ball, uh, a ball with a ball, <laughs> inside, and spinning it around, and tracking the movement. And then we print out the, the, the movement tracks. And we do it all over, go, uh, all over, and we see, does it change by doing the same? So then they learn about stati statistics, they learn about dynamics, the interference, and everything like that. And they get something fun to print out. We can use as a fruit ball or something like that. Materials, learn a lot about materials. We tried to print out with sugar. We had a powder machine in 3D printing. and we pour in sugar in it and find out how can we print something out in sugar to eat. Now we can get this chocolate printer, but we thought this was much cooler, especially 12 years ago. 
So materials we can do. Uh, marketing and sales, for those who were in my previous presentation, this was something that we did uh, with the class to also see how does something move all the way to the end of the, of the cycle. So they made phone covers and we put it out on a website and they could sell it. Um, as I also told there, it was a huge success, too big success. We had to pull the whole thing down after a couple of weeks because uh, we were swarmed by uh, orders. And the students found out that uh, although these things are quite cool, um, it took me for hour, several hours to actually produce something that looks this cool. So the prices and, and time, so we, we just stopped it. But they learned a valid lesson. So, and all these things led to, and now we come to the second layers. This is one layer to learn, to uh, teach the students how to use 3D printers, how to uh, learn about mechanics, simulation, a little bit about marketing. But also, after doing this for several years, we found some patterns, and that meant, meant that we made a model. Uh, we call it the IC approach, which is actually an approach to design for 3D printing, because that's kind of been luring in the background all the time. So, again, to go quickly through this, it's got four letters. Uh, it's always nice with it. IC is kind of an uh, aberration that we kind of liked. Um, and basically, it's about first to adapt. You have to adapt to uh, pretty much everything. Adapt the methods. The methods are kind of just a suggestion, but you have to adapt it to the situation you are in. Uh, integrate integrate functionality, and there's a whole thing about 3D printing. You can build pretty much anything, so you should integrate as much as possible. Uh, compensate, God, everybody was running, worked with a 3D printer, they know that it's plenty of things to compensate. But on the other hand, it's also something that you could compensate and run for a company. Because you don't need just to make the product, you can also make the little things that makes your ordinary production to go. And then the final thing, the LM gate, which is kind of where we see linked back to that model I said, uh, one is really not interesting because making one, that has to be really expensive. So the other thing was to see how could we elongate the whole process? How could you design for elongation? A little bit the same thing as designing for program, things that's not tangible, things that are not real. Could we do that the same way with physical products, elongate it? elongated the whole process. So this is a whole chapter in itself. I'm go not going to delve into that. The whole point of showing it is that from letting the students play around with it and make different kind of discussions, we could also actually evolve a research field, which actually could be used for not only students, but the industry out there. So the students are kind of interacting and creating practice-based research research through design, which is also a good thing, which is then a third layer that we get out of this educational model. So, then we're getting into this, the last part, uh, and that's designing design education. There's a lot of design going on here. Um, so this is a little bit how we, during some 10, 20 years, running some 100 projects, I think, running it quite fast and furious, everything from three weeks to half a year, but a lot of three weeks projects. And what we kind of found out from this um, process. Um, for instance, by iterating the educational model, think about again, I said that iterating is cool and also failing is cool. It's not so cool to fail a whole course with students because, okay, I can do it again, but the students have kind of done it. But we run this thing here just for three years with the same boring thing, phone covers. We've done a lot of other things, but this is so everybody understands what it is. And we saw that the first time we let people uh, have some kind of a profile and the designers should design for them. Not a good idea. Uh, some said that I like uh, fast cars. Can you make a uh, phone cover for me? Uh, well, hard to say. The next time we said, okay, you just designer, you decide what you want to, what you want to do. And that's the project we went out on the web with. They said, okay, here is my design. Do you want it? And that's probably the most proper way to do it too. But we didn't give up on this one. We went back here and we said, that, okay, can you design something for an organization? Because this organization could have it as a giveaway or whatever. So learning from here, learning from there, kind of iterated us all the way to this third iteration. And 
the next year we will do a fourth iteration of these things, bringing back what we learned on all these things and see how could we combine this, how can we iterate, how can we use that design practice to get where we want to. Okay, and what it all comes down to is motivation. I mean, everybody who has done teaching knows that if you can motivate your students, you are halfway there, at least. That's kind of the really big thing. Unmotivated students said, you could just as well leave the room. It doesn't work. Another thing is, of course, that we come from a school that have um, project-based teaching. Engineer, uh, designers and architects are doing project-based all the time. It's kind of in the nature of making things. Um, but and all of everybody's saying that, oh, project-based is so much better than lecture-based. It's, it's, it's debatable. It seems like they have done some tests in medical schools, which actually the outcome is not so big difference. And it seems like the overachieving, the 3%, they do well in any case. So, but for the people below, we see that doing project-based learning is a good thing. But we still do lectures because lectures are much more effective. That's the reason why we have lectures. We can have, I can talk to you all the same time. I could go around with each of you and give the same talk, but that would kind of be a little bit tedious. So this is the uh, motivation, four kinds of motivation. Uh, we have the intrinsic. The intrinsic is kind of, I do it because I think it's fun. No one pressures me. This kind of gives me peace of mind. You know this little kid that makes drawings all the time. You kind of have fun doing it. Extrins extrinsic is kind of the other thing. Oh, mommy, look at this drawing. Look at this drawing. Isn't it nice? Can I get some kind of positive feedback on this thing here? Is that possible? So the extrinsic is kind of the, what the outer things gives you. And tacit knowledge. I don't know how many of you know about tacit knowledge. A couple of you. Uh, someone has described it as the uh, pedagogist equivalent to physicist dark matter because it's kind of a little bit difficult to quite understand. Um, but it's, it's more about, uh, I almost said it's about practicing, pressing your skills, improving your skills. And, and that's kind of uh, the movement that you do. But you do something over and over. Athletes and musicians are doing it all the time. On the other side here, we got uh, the explicit which is kind of me telling you that this thing has to work like this. You have to press that button. You have to understand this and that. It's kind of really concrete and clear. That means that we have four different kinds of motivation. Four different kinds of motivation we can play around with, which we can influence. It's not one, it's four. So what do we do with this? Well, just an example. This is uh, a project. In three weeks, they're going to make detergent bottles. Really interesting thing. Um, what you see here is a typical, what do you think so? The student doing this, is it tacit? Is it explicit? This is not the first time the student is doing this. It's tacit. It's working with clay. Doing it. It's getting more and more fun. It's getting, getting closer to something. It's not the first time you're doing it. It's still training for this. And it, hopefully, he or she likes it too. So it's actually intrinsic too. Instead of me dying, okay, that's not good enough. You have to move on. You have to get things faster done. This is. And Did you get the practice by doing extrinsic, um, by doing explicit? So the teacher says, pick up the play and start squeezing it. Yep. And then you start feeling what it, you, then you get two-way communication going. Yep. And, and say and also at some point you have to start with explicit and then it moves into right. tacit right. true so at this point I was lucky I had students that already have worked with clay so for me it was just a go and do it in clay oh yes of course I do that cool um, the next thing is um, when do you know when, when do you teach how things are done and that's kind of the really key here for you as a teacher you not being just a facilitator and telling people how to do it and where to do it and where do I follow you and is it too hot in here or something like that. When do you share your knowledge? Is it at some point you share your knowledge? When are the students motivated to listen to you? It's not always, I tell you. At some point they don't care. But at some point they're really running after you and asking you and that's where you want. You want that guy to, you want to be that guy that people want to, to ask. That's why you become a teacher, not that you're running after the students. That's a bad thing. 
Um, just a little intermediate picture here. We kicked out our big class computer class. We don't do it anymore. Now students learn CAD systems. They have half an hour, we show it uh, how the computer system works, and then we say, back to your classrooms, start designing a bottle. It takes forever, but God, they get good. And they have the motivation, the inner motivation to actually learn it because they want to see their design, which is really the, the key thing here. If I tell them, I said, okay, if you want to make a bottle like this, you have to do this and this and this, they have forgotten the first message I told them. But if they figure it out themselves, getting frustrated, things are good. That doesn't mean we don't keep them totally out. We have senior students going around. Not too many, so they have to be a little bit frustrated because they have to wait and get angry and try to figure it out themselves. But at some point, they get some help and can continue. So, after doing this for so many times, we start to figure out what, what's happening. How can we be smart about where do I put my resources? I have so much money, I have so many teachers, I have so many students. How can I, during a three weeks project, kind of get the most out of my resources? So we made a motivation timeline. And what you see here is that this nice, beautiful colors, which has the same colors as the different kind of motivations. And we see that during a project, these different motivations are kind of peaking at the different times during a project. So when knowing when they are in kind of an intrinsic, tacit, uh, motivated model, then I know what to do. And what I really want to know is, when is the time for me to actually go in and do something? Or when should I just stay the hell away? Because at some point, you should that. You should just don't be there. Sometimes they just come in, any questions? No, then I'll leave. That's a good thing. So, just to bring back these examples, um, the first, part here. That's where they get the task. That's uh, quite explicit. You got to do this. They heard it before. Okay, you're going to make detergent bottles again, or for the first time, or whatever. It's quite explicit. They got the things. And they kind of motivate in the beginning, so it started a little bit high up, and then it's quickly get it a little bit down, because it's okay, now we heard what you're going to want to do, and yeah, sort of. But at some point, And you see here, they get into the mode of actually start doing it. Because what they really want to do was shaping. These guys are there to make things. They want to make something that looks good. So they start making things. And beautifully enough, they are now in the intrinsic tacit no phase. At this phase here, I have to run a, lot, a bit around and see that, oh, have you done your analysis? Have you checked the internet? Have you asked your mom and dad what kind of detergent bottles they use and la di da, all these things? But, but here, hopefully, they are a little bit on their own. Of course, you bring in uh, a teacher or something like that or to give you forms so they can get some feedback on it. But mainly, this is a fantastic place for the students to be. So, moving on. Here, at this point, they have come so far, now they're going to make something more substantial of it. This is the time they want to learn 3D printing. They want to know the explicit way how to operate the 3D printer. If I gave them the 3D printer here, they said, okay, cool stuff. Some of them will say, oh, I dreamed about this all my life. Can I start tinkering with it? But most of them say, ah, yeah, cool. But here, Oh, I want, I, want to, I want to see this rebuttal in real life. How can I make this work? So in this period, which is usually a bit going down, we beef them up because now they want to learn something. So they are highly explicit, motivated. Uh, then they move up again. They get these bottles out. That's fun enough. But it kind of goes down a little bit again, going through the motion for the second time. And... Then it's time for a midterm presentation. And then suddenly, we are at the extrins extrinsic thing. Because now they have to be judged by something. Now they can get out of their comfort zone. Someone is going to talk to them. This is not for the same project, but this guy is the head of uh, development in Adidas. We brought him up. And I can tell you these guys were really afraid of letting this guy down. He's a lovely guy. That was not the problem. But they really want to satisfy him. So they were really in that explicit mode. So a tough area because they know what to do. 
they have done it before, but now they don't have this kind of calm in their thing that they feel sure about it. So it's other things that other, other things that motivates them. And then the final thing here, where it starts to be important for me. Because one of the things I want to teach them during this course, it's not only about designing things, it's not about detergent bottles either. One of the things I want to learn them, teach them, is how do you produce stuff like this? What's the, <coughs> what's, what, what can, can you produce anything? Because in the beginning here, we say you're going to make uh, detergent bottles. You can go to the shop and see how does it look. Then you get an initial idea of how it looks. But when you get to this point here, they have kind of the idea. No, they want to know how could this be realized? Because the company who's come in there and said, that, okay, we're going to produce it if we think it's cool and if it's possible to produce. So now they suddenly get some they know, that they know their product really, really well. They really know how they want it to look like. But when we started discussing, okay, it can't be that sharp angles. They are hanging to your lips. So when do I give a lecture here? I give it here to introduce it, and I don't do anything before I get here. And here I give the lectures about how to produce it. And now all 32 students are hanging at my lips and have questions and want to discuss it and compare the different things. Why is that possible? Why, is, why, why isn't this possible? I've seen something on the net. I've seen this one. I brought this from back from my mother. This, is this producible? Why, why can't? And so on. And that's fantastic because then everybody is engaging and getting curious. And it's just a positive thing. And for me as a teacher, that's so much more interesting than doing it here when I see people oh, I just want to go back to my clay and working on that. They're not interested in listening to me at all. Here they are, big time. So by saving my time and other times, I can start doing here. And why is peeping, peeking here? Because now they see kind of the end of the project. They see where they're going. They see where all these things comes together. It, they don't need me anymore to go back. And Okay, now we have to go back and work. Now we have to go back and work. They are self-going here. They have fun, they see where they're going, they want to push these things to the maximum, they want to solve all the problems with their design, and at some point it converge because things kind of, okay, no, I just have to finish this. I have two days left for my presentation, I need to, to finish the whole thing. And that's this point here, that's the time you stay away. This is the time you stay away because Going in here and said, ah, well, you should maybe go. No, it's not a good idea. They are here now. They are gone all the, all the loop. They are on their way to close out. They still discuss it with each other. But then they're moving out into the final phase, the extrinsic again, the same as they had over here. Now they're going to make the big presentation. Now they're going to get the hopefully applaud for the company that's there and end the project. So. Some end notes. Um, apposite learning met methods is about, I mean, it's about much more than this, but um, just kind of a couple of pointers. Knowing when you should apply which methods and how to do it is kind of important, actually. So just knowing what is not, it's not there. You need... Uh, and a positive toolbox, appropriate tools, appropriate methods, and knowing when to do it. Be conscious about the methods you use. No students, neither individual or as groups, are the same. We all know that. So using the right tool for a right job is vital. I mean, of course, this is kind of banal talking. Students are different. But how can you kind of facilitate so that works? How can you use your tools so that actually works? Some of you want to read more about it because the title of this uh, last part here is publicized in this just-in-time teaching, just in need learning, which is kind of the mantra that we're talking about there. How can we kind of combine those two things? It's a bit about lean education almost like, you know, lean manufacturing, delivering parts in, in just-in-time. 
it's a little bit the same thing that we're trying to do. And we see that when I go back and now organize a project, I can say that, okay, you have to come in there. You have to go in there. We don't need that. We don't need that. It sounds a little bit mundane, but it's done fabulous thing for actually running and administrating these courses. And the students are getting more and more happy too because they feel that they get the help when they need it and they don't have teachers summing around the classroom and being a nuisance when they don't want them to be. Thank you. <laughs>